This is American Real, where we aim to inspire, empower, and enlighten you through the stories of our guests. Here's your host, Roger Brooks. There's a large number of people. I mean, basically, they're scared to do anything other than stay in their lane and not disrupt and collect their paycheck. And they're really not going too far. How would you talk to those people? I would say, what is the time that you have that you could get curious about something else? With some people, it might be their drive time or their time on the train. And the way to revisit it is to start reading the people who are expert at it. I mean, even people like Tony Robbins and people that are transforming in front of me. So if they can transform, I can transform because it's just normal average people that are transforming. So I would say pursue something that is of interest to you. And what I talk about, it could be a course, it could be a hobby. Take the minutes that you have and start taking small increments and small actions. This is American Real. I am Roger Brooks. My guest today is Marty Constant. You are a workplace futurist and the best-selling author of Activate Your Agile Career. You have an MBA from the University of Chicago Booth School of Business and are a former technology executive that has worked in Silicon Valley. As a top career influencer, you have been featured in media outlets such as NBC Chicago, Forbes, and The Muse, and have worked in companies like Samsung, Dow Jones, and Apple. In addition, you are an expert in applying agile principles to workforce development. Marty, welcome to the show. So happy to be here, Roger. Um, I love your show, and um, it's fun. I was just listening to one of your shows, uh, recorded at 3 a.m. in Australia. Oh my gosh. I don't even, I don't even remember that. Yeah. Yeah. It was in June and one of your guests in it, of this year, I know you do a lot of recordings, but um, it's three o'clock in the morning um, for him. Wow. Wow. Yeah. No, it's, it's great. And it's such a great way to uh, communicate with the world, right? When we have this platform and I know we were talking before we actually started that you've done many of these. So you make my job today, um, you know, very easy but I would love to just ask you a couple of things about where you are. You're, I know you're in Chicago. Um, how are things in Chicago? How is work? How's the work-life balance happening in, in that city, in that part of the world? Well, Chicago is doing really great. Um, unlike some other parts of the country, it's, the, the weather has been fantastic. And I think it's a metaphor for me for uh, the cool energetic days of fall that there's lots going on here lots of energy lots of in-person events um continuing to be uh, a combination of online events and, and in-person events so i i couldn't be any happier and i don't own a car um so i do a lot of uh you know, Uber when I need to get somewhere or rent a car. So um, I feel very flexible in my environment here. And, you know, if we just think back, and I know so many people talk about this, but I, I love to get people's perspectives. But if we think back just three years ago, who would have thought that not only from a technology standpoint, because I know you, we have a lot to talk about there, but the world has changed with the pandemic um, with just what's happening worldwide with, you know, on, on the political scene, but more than anything, I'd love to know your thoughts on where you were three years ago and how that compares to today, like back in 2019. Okay. So 2019, it does seem like a long time ago. And I think, um, it wasn't that far away from when I had launched my book activate your agile career. So, you know, a few years ago, my aim and my goal was to be talking to people in person, doing a road show for my book, um, speaking on a stage, doing training at the corporate level. And the uh, very strange and curious event was that 
because so much was virtual, many of us became quite skilled at buying the technology and learning about lighting, learning about the, um, the microphones that we should use so that we could be as professional as possible and to be engaging in the, these meetings because let's face it, Zoom got pretty boring pretty fast, didn't it? Oh, yes. Yes, absolutely. So um, I am curious though about the, the, the way your world has actually changed um, since that time has have have you been able to embrace uh, all the things that all the challenges that we've had uh, coming out of it, and it just seems like such a different world today. Did you think what happened would have ever happened in our lifetimes? Um, I didn't think about that, and I was just listening to a podcast this morning talking about um, spinning the gold out of. Uh, environments that don't work for us and trying to capture what's best. And I think there were uh, two different ways to approach it. There were people that really slid back, but I'd say I heard a lot of stories and I experienced it myself is I feel like my projection of what it is that I was doing as a workplace futurist became more important. I was booked more often for training. I spoke around the world more often because we could. Um, I speak on the future of work and I speak on the topic of agility. So three global um, agility organizations you know, asked me to speak along with all other experts on agility, whether it be agile software development, agile mindset. Um, in my case, it was career agility. So. I was able to interact with people in a global way like never before. And it reminded me of when I was a chief marketer and I traveled all around the world um, to promote software. I you know went to, went to China, went to Europe, went to lots of different places, was uh, semi headquartered in Australia. So did a lot of traveling and really enjoyed that and felt like I was learning so much. So I would say in the last two years, that was escalated. Um, it, it's been said that to get really good at something, do it for 20 hours, do it 20 times. And I felt like engaging and figuring out how to put together online training and to, to build out the exercises so that people would get engaged and to um, have them participate, not just in polls, but in some of the other ways, the, the breakout sessions and being able to bring that to the table made it feel so much more human and personal. So I would say that happened in the last three years. And now that the world has opened up, I feel like stepping back into in-person events has just been a great positive thing. And I feel like I I wouldn't be who I am today without this experience of gaining a human connection online. Yeah, no, it's really remarkable. And speaking of that, uh, the way you and I met was through our, our mutual friend and colleague, David Breyer, and you took his master class. I would love to get a sense from you, Marty, as far as, number one, why did you enroll in that program? Um, and then what did it actually do for you and your world through that nine, nine to 10 week process? Yeah. So brand intervention, um, I, I keep my notes and mindset uh, about that front and center all the time. And uh, I, it's the one thing that I remember so clearly is understanding your own superpower and what you are really good at that no one else can do it the way that you do it. So when I think of David, um, he's expert at understanding and looking and helping people cultivate what's hiding in plain sight, what's hiding right there. And in, that, in, in just working with all of that. And during that time period, I was taking on some coaching clients um, in the career space, but my real entry into work when I left the corporate world was on this 
cultivating agility training and bringing the future to the present, but I was doing coaching. So I ended up working on one project with the brand intervention um, area and learned so much. And I've now taken that and applied it to what it is that I'm doing now. So I was doing some one-on-one coaching because it was just coming um, to me. And now I am solidly back working with corporations. Um, so that's that's what that's what David and I would say that I wouldn't be saying what I'm saying right now, which is what does Marty do? I help you bring your future to the present. That's so awesome. I help, yeah, I help people and organizations. Why is that important? It's important because one of the, you know, you always have to have a problem and a solution. The big problem for me since I was a kid was stagnation. If you're sitting still, you're not growing. So it's been a systemic thing, but being able to cultivate that now and articulate that now is really important. So agility is the solution for stagnation. When change happens, don't do nothing. That is so awesome. So I have a, a kind of a challenging question for you in this regard. And that is, how do you take an industry, say like um, the gas and convenience industry, where it's been around, you know, since automobiles uh, uh, were invented and has progressed and progressed. And now it's this enormous industry, yet, you know, the world and the governments are moving toward a, a more, um, you know, user-friendly type of fuel, which would be electric charging, right? So how, how would you talk to that audience and say, okay, Mr. Gas and Convenience Store owners, uh, you've been selling fuel, that's how you've made your living, but we now need to look to the future. Um, would that be a kind of a good example of what you might do in your expertise? Talk to that type of um, uh, industry? Uh, yes. I mean, I don't deal as much in the consumer industry, but everything I do relates. So absolutely. I mean, I've dealt with um, energy companies and oil companies and tech companies um, and even medical device companies. And they're all facing the same thing that gas and convenience stores would be um, facing. And I would say there's three things that I would tell them. You, you defined one of them, but I would go deeper. So I would say to the person that owns that particular store or owns a chain of them is follow your DNA. Be prepared to D, disrupt your model by challenging your assumptions about what you think works in your industry. So kind of open up that space. So that's the D in DNA. And then I would say, notice the signals and the trends. So the N for notice. Signals sometimes are happening 10 to 20 years before we even notice them as the trend. I'm more expert at understanding trends than uh, people like Alvin Toffler who predicted things that were happening 20 and 30 years in advance. They saw the signals. And I'll give you an example of a signal. 20 years ago, or maybe yeah, probably 15 to 20 years ago, um, 11 and 12 year old girls in Japan were texting with those flip feature phones. That became the genesis of what we across the rest of the country did 10 years later, right? With smartphones and all that. So that's a signal. And there were people that were monitoring those signals, Amy yeah. Webb, uh, was one of them, a great futurist. So I would say, okay, notice the signals and the trends. The trend that you're saying is cars are electric. Well, we actually knew this several years ago. When I was working in Silicon Valley, we had chargers everywhere. We didn't have them in Chicago, 2015, 2014. Now I see them all over the place, but we didn't have them, but they had them in California. So California had a lot more of that, the Google cars and all that. So I'd say notice the trends. And then the third is act. So notice your D, actually cultivate your DNA. So I would say to the gas station owners and convenience store owners, what are the trends? Um, what are people buying um, at the stations? Um, what, what needs to change 
Um, some organizations end up doing more online and more off, more offline in person. Uh, reconfiguration of what you know, uh, uh, attending to people's needs. So the reconfiguration of that station to accommodate, like I would say right away, we need more electric charging stations. I felt like there wasn't enough of them like eight years ago in California when I saw them. You know, people got the be better parking spots if they were charging their cars, if, if you're parking in a California parking lot. I think things like that need to be done um, with that. So that, that that's how I would say is actually dive deep into understanding. And, and I, would, I would love to throw it back to you. This is what I do in, in sessions is, what other trends do you think um, are impacting the way people buy cars today? Uh, the way that they buy gas today? Do you have any observations? Roger, Brooks, do you have any observations about that? I'd love to like- Yeah, no. And, and that that's one that was actually a follow up question I have, but we could let's take the conversation there. And, and one of the things I see um, and I have to, you know, just as a form of disclosure, I happen to be part of this uh, emerging market is the future of payments. So um, thinking about it this way. So traditionally, you know, we've had cash, we've had credit cards, but now there's something called machine based payments. The machine, the vehicle will be the payment device. We're starting to th see things in Dash right now. Um, there's telematics uh, that are in fleet and commercial vehicles. So what's the future of that look like? Well, to me, it looks like this. You pull up to a fuel pump or an EV charging station, and the car will validate itself with that fuel pump or charging station and allow it to do what it needs to do, fuel or... And at the same time, we're measuring the fuel tank. We're also looking at the diagnostics of the vehicle to make sure everything's okay, to send a message to the driver if there's a, a, an issue with the air in the tire. Um, and then let's take it a step further. You want to take that vehicle and get something to eat. You pull into a Dunkin' Donuts or a McDonald's. There's no more exchange of card or cash. The vehicle becomes that payment instrument and talks to the point of sale device. And it goes on and on. The car wash, the tolls, as we already have seen that for years. Um, insurance, anything that vehicle consume can consume. Now that vehicle could pay. To me, that's the future. So, so you're talking about something. I worked in the um, mobile device space and in the intelligent um, devices. Um, I worked in the Internet of Everything before it was known as the Internet of Everything back in 2012, 10 years ago. And so what you're talking about really is an internet of any everything example. It's just a device, you know, and it, it, a device could be your refrigerator. It could, you know, be monitoring the food that's in there, that the healthy food, the stuff that's not so healthy. So it can be monitoring all of that. So the internet of everything is a really good example of a signal from about 10 to 20 years ago. Now it's a trend, right? So the, um, our cars are no longer um, gasoline vehicles. They're big computers. Computers, right? So we have to be, uh, we have to make certain that they're more secure. We have to make certain that they're not subject to hacking. There's all kinds of things that we have to do right now because our cars are computers. We also have to be mindful that our cars, when we have supply chain issues and we uh, don't have the um, elements to build into the, to the cars, the smart um the smart pieces that are building our cars, not, not the metal and not the tires, but the rest of the guts of it. So I would say, yes, an internet of everything is absolutely a great example. So whether it be a car or, or something else, I mean, in Chicago, I see these motorized, um, you know, scooters, like every, a lot of things are being motorized that were never even motorized before. But I think the car is a good one. I don't own a car, but I will say this. There's a lot of cars on the road. There's a backlog um, of cars uh, right now, or uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's more demand than there is um, availability of, of cars right now. So we have that to contend with as well. So, and then, and then Roger, we didn't talk about sustain, sustainability. Like how does sustainability enter into the equation in the, dis, in the discussion with car ownership? You know, this is like people that uh, would be 
owning, you know, the Google cars. Okay. If you just are using a car for a car that comes to your, to your house, it'll driverless, you hop in it and you go to wherever you need. It's all pre-programmed in, and then someone else is using it an hour later. So this becomes the ultimate sustainable smart device. Wow. Now I know you like to talk about, um, you know, when change happens, you may have actually touched on this earlier, when change happens, don't do nothing, right? So if you do nothing, you'll be left behind, right? Is that the whole- Well, idea? even worse. Is that, um, is that seared? It's not, yeah, it's not just being left behind, it's getting trampled. It's getting, um, losing your existence. Uh, and so um, stagnation, I mean, we've all talked about the deer in the headlights in a row, like if the deer doesn't move, they may get hit and injured and even worse um, than that. So it is important to, to take action versus not. Now, we often talk about those famous examples of Kodak and Blockbuster and all that, but let's just talk about, if we're going to talk about the future, let's talk about Apple and Google, and the companies that are stalwart tech companies right now, we're assuming that they're gonna be there forever. And we assumed that with uh, in Amazon, right? We assumed that because companies like GM and GE, it's like they were there, but they're, they're different now. IBM is different, became a services company, right? It was no longer like known for computers the way that it was before. So it adapted and evolved to become um, still important. And so if you look at, um, companies like Apple and Google, what can they be doing now to ensure their relevance in the future? We can't assume that their models are going to be infinitely applicable. Just right. like we can't assume, I mean, it seems like Amazon owns everything, right? I mean, I, I use it a lot, right? It's very convenient and um, stuff comes same day. Um, sometimes and the robotics or the uh, chatbots, I guess, that are being used today to make things simple and seamless are just awesome. So I, you know, I would say every company can't, every company has to be prepared to disrupt its model. Just like we as entrepreneurs are having to figure out how to disrupt the model of what it meant to be an entrepreneur five years ago versus now. That's so awesome. Yeah. And one of the things that came to mind when you're talking about Apple and, and Google in particular is that, and I just found this out fairly recently, is that we all remember BlackBerry, right? We all, most of us had a BlackBerry and then BlackBerry fell off the face of the earth. But if you actually research it today, BlackBerry is the number one operating system in Dash for, for vehicles, so the, the operating system that's powering 70 plus percent of the vehicles is from BlackBerry. They reinvented. So that was actually a great example that I learned. I thought they were done. That They reinvented. Well, what's interesting about that story, because I was in that space of when BlackBerry was um, failing and uh, Nokia used to be really big and they're now, you know, they, they don't do, they, they don't, they're not in the handset business anymore. But what's really cool about that story, because uh, I haven't been following them real closely, is they did not adapt and evolve, um, and they did not acknowledge that the smartphone was going to be a threat. They said, well, we have the world's most secure device for corporate email and phones. It was true at the time. They also, and, but they did it with BlackBerry servers. And so they, they've taken that, that thing, that their core competence back then was these BlackBerry servers, the, the securest email in the world. Their email was more secure than anything Apple could have done, anything Nokia could have done, anything at all. But Apple was convenient. They figured out the security piece. And what Apple figured out is we're in the internet of everything business. We're not in the smartphone business. We're in the internet of everything business. So going um, to what you said, that BlackBerry is adapting, they're still, they, they missed the mark. They ignored the smartphone, but they figured out we've got really super good technology. What can we do with this? The car business is a very slow moving 
decision business, have sold into that in the internet event, everything. Um, so in order for BlackBerry to do that, it's a, it's a very conscious effort of relationships and, you know, making certain, you know, that the, um, that they were saying, you know, we're going to, not only that, we're going to help you, we're going to make your dashboards more secure so people don't hack into your systems. I got to, I imagine that's part of their story. Yeah, no, that's wonderful. It's so great that we just kind of stumbled onto this discussion because I, I really didn't know about all of that, um, your past and in, in the industry that you were in. So that's really awesome. But it does bring up another good point. What, I, what I'm thinking about here is that, and, I, and I'm sure our listeners are as well, like this could be applied um, at the macro level and the micro level, right? So the visas of the world are investing in, you know, hundreds of businesses looking for that next thing, you know, and the entrepreneurs of the world also should be looking at what, you know, what are the trends, you know, um, how can they reinvent? Because if we stay stagnant, no matter if it's micro or macro, um, you know, we could be, as you said, uh, in a pretty big disaster. We could. I, I, I say to this, I mentioned the thing about 12 year old girls in Japan, <laughs> you know, they, they ignited a trend. I didn't even know that until I read Amy Webb's book um, uh, about the signals and the trends. But the 12 year olds right now who are comfortable with gaming are designing our world. In three years, they're gonna be 15. In six years, they're gonna be 18. They are designing our world. So what does convenience mean to them? What does TikTok mean to them? If TikTok right now is becoming more accessed um, for search mm -hmm. and Google, we better pay attention to it. It's not just for 12 to 15 year olds. We might not be using it in the same way for all of our businesses, but we better be aware of how it might affect our business and our buyers. That's so smart. Um, I'd love to kind of shift the conversation a little bit into what you talk about and, and more on the, on the micro, uh, A-B testing your career, um, and you call it life idea. So how, how does one do that? Like, how do you even start to A-B test your career? Yeah, yeah. So, so 10 years ago, uh, 2012, um, I typed in the words career agility in my browser. Zero results. If you type it in now, thousands. Mm -hmm. And when I saw that, I thought, well, that doesn't make sense. Um, I had just been part of a group that had, that had applied agile principles used in the software development process. We were doing this in San Francisco. Uh, we applied it to setting up values and principles for the marketing profession, about 35 global marketers. And so out of that, I thought, okay, well, software development has a set of principles and values. Now, agile marketing in 2012 had it. In 2017, agile HR, and then we have agile and transformation. There's even agile parenting out there, right? So there's in, in what it means. And so in 2012, I said, why can't we take some of those values and principles, create some for the management of one's career? Interviewed 120 people. I commissioned survey research, commissioned a market research firm, and came up with seven principles. One of the principles was be willing to be like a marketer and be willing to A, B, test your career. And when you are a marketer and you are trying to figure out, does this work or does this work? I have three headlines and I don't know which one is going to work on my advertising or on my email. You split test, you test them. You can do this in your career as well and give yourself the permission to test that. But what's fun about the AV testing of your career, you can do it in parallel. You can, because you could do a side interest and you can do it and then ultimately change lanes or you can do it sequentially. You could do it straightforward and you can say, you know what? 
I really liked when I was a designer earlier in my career. I'm going to go back to that because that's what brought me pure joy so that it could be A, B, C test. And you can go back to that or you could look at someone in your workplace and say, well, how is artificial intelligence going to impact the marketing profession right now? What are the roles? And you might find someone that has that kind of a role and you might pal around with that person or take a course or whatever it takes and finagle your way into that next jump in your career. So that's what A-B testing enables you to do. You don't have to say, oh, I studied this, so I have to only go upwards mobility and become a manager and then a director and then a VP. That's one way of doing it, but these sideways, um, these sideways journeys can be pretty exciting. No, I love how you put that. And, uh, um, you know, one of the things I think about often is that there's a large number of people that are either intimidated or fearful or whatever it may be that they either for their main career or for their, their, their side lane career. And they, they just do nothing, right. They just are stagnant. And how would you talk to those people? Because there's a large group of them that they're, they're scared. I mean, basically they're scared to do anything other than stay in their lane and not disrupt and collect their paycheck. And, and they're really not going too far. I would say I've talked to mothers who have like three kids, right? <laughs> or the fathers who have three kids and they um, are so busy. And I say to people, um, what what is the time that you have that you could get curious about something else? With some people, it might be their drive time or their time on the train. So maybe it's listening to Rogers podcast about people who are inspirational and who have made big change in their lives and to figure out what you can learn from some of these awesome case studies on podcasts like yours, or it could be a how to, um, I've been reading, um, you know, how to manifest because I think I sort of left that in the dust, um, several years ago. And I'm, I'm, going to revisit it. And the way to revisit it is to start reading the people who are expert at it. I mean, even people like Tony Robbins and people that are transforming in front of me. So if they can transform, I can transform because it's just normal average people that are transforming. So I would say, pursue something that is of interest to you. And what I talk about, it could be a course, it could be a hobby, um, it could be a mastermind group that you become a part of. I'm joining a new mastermind group next week that's going to go for a whole year. And it's in an area that I've never done work in before. I'm really nervous, but I want to get curious about it because I know that it'll make me better at what I'm doing. So that's what I would say to those people. Take the minutes that you have. And start taking small increments and small actions. If you can go to a conference, go to a conference. Um, when you can get in with other people that are also making great changes, chances are you're going to hang out with the people that, you, you know, a year from now, you will have all advanced. And Mari, where does risk taking come into this? So many people might be, again, fearful of that leap, but then they think about the monetary part of it, right? Like, oh, okay, um, you know, this course I want to take or this mastermind or whatever it may be is a significant investment. Um, I like to tell people it's an investment in yourself, but how does that play into it? And what should people be considering if they've never done anything like this before? Um, I'm a big advocate of lean product testing made famous. Uh, somewhat famous by Eric Ries. And Lean suggests that you test, you experiment, and you test, and you measure and say, what did I learn? What can I do? So Lean product testing allows you to build small prototypes. 
and then you evolve it. And ultimately you have a full blown, pretty mature product on your hands, but it takes a lot of tests to get there. So I would say, and this is, this is a, a basic tenet of agility, agile methodologies is that you test something and you measure it and you can do it incrementally. So, so the definition of an agile career or career agility is a self-reflective, incremental career guided by response to change, evolving job roles, and designed to optimize creativity, growth, and happiness. Hmm. So, so notice, and that, that's the definition that's number one on, on, on Google. I mean, I, I, I own the spot. Like most people like do search engine optimization for years write a foundation article that says, you know, how to, or um, what is, and you can get there. But yeah, the, I would say the risk taking can be very small and it can be testing. And, and the other question I, I say to people that are fearful, I go, what I use this economic term that I absolutely love. What is the opportunity cost of not doing it. So the opportunity cost is like, what are you going to lose if you don't do this? What's at stake here if you don't do this? Stagnation, disappointment, frustration, not living up to your full potential, wanting to be more for your kids. I mean, these are huge opportunity costs. So taking a risk in small increments, and this is classic project management, classic project project management states that you take a big, big project to break it out into smaller pieces. You, you do a 90 day sprint or a 30 day sprint, whatever it is for you. And that's part agile as well. You finish that and you move on to the next part of the equation. Yeah, no, I have a question off of that, but first I did want to ask, cause I think it's related. Um, in today's business climate, you talk about flexing rather than fading, right? So is that, is that part of that whole process where you really need to flex and um, lean into it? Yeah, I think flexing is another way that goes hand in hand with being flex, being flexible and adaptable and agile are like the three, you know, three things that you can combine together. And very often people might say, oh, well, that person is job hopping. They're almost too flexible, aren't they? And I'd say you need to look at, you know, flexibility is important. People like flexible people. They like people that adapt to change rather than dig their feet in and aren't willing to change. They like people that are open versus closed. They like people that are have a growth mindset instead of a rigid mindset. So we, you know, the book's already been written about that. And it's that kind of thing. If, if, you, if you're not that way, um, there are certain ways, uh, you know, certain types of accounting jobs and certain types of roles where not being flexible is really important. You have to make that decision. But there are other things about your life that could be more flexible. Awesome. And Marty, I wanted to circle back to your book. I know uh, I mentioned it in the introduction. You mentioned it once as well, but it's called a Activate Your Agile Career. Um, you just touched on something earlier that made me think of it again, and that is, you know, classic project management, right? The, the breaking down the, the 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 large project into a ninety day, you know, period, and that's actually something I do when I help people write their first book. I'm curious about how you approached your own book. And if you use these same principles that you talk about and you're so good at in getting that book together, because I feel today, um, you know, having a book, it's like a calling card, right? Especially if you're in in any form of business where you're trying to set yourself apart and, and you're able to, you know, discuss your views and your experiences and your stories, you could put that into the book. But really curious about how you went about your own project of writing your book? Well, everybody's book journey is different. And I'm super thrilled that you are helping people because 
you're probably helping them project management and kickstart um, their ideas into reality. Um, my personal journey, it was a five-year journey. I, 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 you know, I have an MBA um, from University of Chicago. I'm super, super curious. I do a ton of research anytime I do anything. So I probably researched more than the average. I invested $10,000 in um, market research because I wanted to be right. I didn't want to be super wrong. I didn't want it to be an opinion book. So I took longer and I was also working and traveling for my job. Um, so it's hard to do it. But I didn't, the, the point that I'd like to make here, it's not so much that I got something done in in one year. The point is I was making progress. I started the research project. I interviewed 120 people. I documented all of the learnings from that. I did, you know, did all that and go, well, what, what, do, I, what do I have here? How do these principles, before I even started writing. So I think it's different for everybody, but the point that you make is, um, depending on the kind of book you're writing, if you have the data to write your book, you can write a book in a year. You can write a book in nine months. You can write a book in six months. People have done it. So it can be done. And it, it all depends if I allocated more of my time to do that book, um, I could have compressed that time. But I was doing a lot of traveling and um, responsible for a lot of uh, business for you know, a major uh, technology company at the time uh, while doing that. So, uh, so yes, breaking it down, I definitely had it broken down into processes. And like you, like the people that are hiring you, I hired a uh, developmental editor. Like I wanted to make sure that what I was writing made sense. Right. So I would do writing by chapter and she would give me all this feedback. And then um, like, I don't understand what you're saying here, Marty. What is it that you're trying to say? And I'd say what I'm trying to say. And she'd say, say that. You know, so we, we do that. And then, then there was like a regular editor and then there was a proofer and there was a book designer. Yeah. Right. And, you know, so I had like five people that I was working with and paying uh, to get it done. And then um, I had um, 15 to 16 models and illustrations that I was going to, you know, work on with Fiverr. And I ended up, you know, I'm a designer. So I ended up illustrating them myself after figuring out that who better than me. So I'm known for a lot of these line work illustrations that demonstrate um, how to do something. So I use them in the book as well. That's so awesome. No, thank you for walking us through that because uh, it is, it's a process, right? So the, the first part, the hardest part, in my opinion, is to get the thing written, right? So no one's going to actually write it for you unless you want to spend a fortune and get a ghostwriter, but I don't really like that because it's not written in your voice, but you know, then you need this team, you need this team around you. And I think it's wonderful that, cause I had no idea about this with you, but the fact that you did that is incredible because you were able to surround yourself with the team that gave you all those other pieces to make it come to life. Now, some people could do it alone, you know, it, 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 I, I think it's a lot more challenging, but in our process, that's exactly what we do. We, you know, we bring the editor to the table, the, the content editor first, and then the copy editor, and then the designer and, and keep the author a part of every step of it. Um, and, and, and we're trying to disrupt not only, um, you know, the, the need to become an author and, and the importance of that, but also the publishing industry, because the industry itself is, you know, not a nice or friendly industry to to the author. Right. So we flip that model upside down. And instead of taking 92 percent of your royalties, we take zero because you as the author deserve 100 percent of those royalties. And, you know, people are finding it really refreshing. But love the fact that you went through that entire process, surrounded yourself with you know, wonderful people to help you, you know, bring that book to fruition? Well, it, it speaks to a mindset. It's the, this mindset of investing in yourself. You and I met when I was doing some work with uh, David Breyer's group. Um, and I've always believed in investing. So even when I was working at a corporation, people, you know, other people, I was even a VP of marketing and they, 
the corporation wouldn't just pay for me to learn stuff. So what I would do is I'd, I'd get a speaking engagement sometimes. And so then I would have my corporation, oh, I got the speaking engagement, you know, and it, it'll be good for the company. It's good. And so they would give me the time off and they would um, pay for my trip um, to get there sometimes, right? And, and, and if they didn't, um, if they didn't pay for my airfare or even my hotel, I would pay for that, but they would give me the time off. And so to me, if you're not willing to invest in yourself, um, even when you're, you know, making a small amount of money, it's going to be a problem for you later on. I, I hear all the time, like, you know, churchgoers that give money, people that don't have a lot of money, give, they have a habit of giving money and they help others. And I'm all, I've always been really impressed with that because if you don't have a mindset of giving money or saving money or doing or investing in yourself, it's going to be a problem for you. Yeah. Wow. So refreshing. So refreshing to hear all that you have done in your career. Look, I could talk to you all day. This is uh, just so fascinating to me. I'm really into the conversation. <clears throat> I want to continue our relationship off the podcast because I think it's important and, and and for people to know, right? So I encourage people uh, like you, Mari, like whatever business you're in, get on some podcasts, have these conversations. You never know what doors are going to open and where things will lead. So thank you so much for your time today. I do have two last questions before I let you go. I like to ask every guest. One is if you were to pick up your phone right now and call the 20 year old Marty, what would you say to her? Um, I would say two things, if not now, when, what are you waiting for? And, um, don't worry about what other people think. Mm. Like just this, this is the time to have tunnel vision, believe in yourself. So, um, so that, that, that's what I would say. And, and, and I, would, I would elaborate on that. It's something that Jeannie Gang, world famous architect said, she asked herself three questions. Um, she, she's an architect, right? Interior, space planning, exterior, beautiful work all over the world. And she said, uh, she looks at um, what's there, what's missing and what's possible. Mm. And that this is this is a true artist, right? I mean, we're all designers. Yeah. What's missing, and what's possible, and and what's there to begin with? So we get back to that sustainable part. But yeah. so I, I elaborated on the question, so I cheated a little bit there. That's, yeah. okay. That's okay. And last question is: uh, at the end of the day, you still have a lot of life to live. You still have a lot of people to help. But what do you want ultimately? What do you want your legacy to be? I want to cure stagnation in a way that enables people to be the best of themselves because I know it's inside each and every one of us. Awesome. Marty Constant, welcome to the American Real Family. Thank you so much for sharing your insights and your time with us today. And uh, really look forward to releasing this episode very soon. My pleasure, Roger. Thanks for tuning in to American Real. Be sure to visit our website, AmericanReal.tv, or search for us on iTunes or YouTube for past episodes. While you're there, please rate us or leave us a review, as that helps others find our show. I am truly grateful and appreciate all of your support. If you'd like to be part of our inner circle or want one on one coaching, check out the American Real Learning Academy, where we have self-help groups and courses so you can build the best you. We also have a new Facebook group where you can connect with high achievers from around the world. If you want to go even further, maybe you're determined to write your own book or launch your own podcast, contact me today to see if we can help. You can reach me through Instagram or Facebook or email me directly at roger at americanreal.tv. Thanks for tuning in and we'll see you next week.